the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. pray. Extravagant God, you have promised treasure in heaven that outweighs any we could envision or imagine on earth. Help us to be grateful for the amazing gifts you have already given us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. this morning, this dreary day. All ready for football? I am. Today we are reading Psalm 20, and I'm Joanna Mahoney, if you do not know me. And that is on page 859 of the Bible in, the Bible in your pew. Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for the joy of your victory and lift up our banners in the name of the Lord. May the Lord grant you all your requests. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with victorious power of his right hand. 
Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are, sought, they are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. It says, beginning in verse 7, I'm going to back up to verse 5 in that chapter. Jesus says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their, full, their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is, is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do, you mean, don't, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, their sins your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. So this weekend I was struck by the contrast that I experienced, at least for me, um, and then really kind of beginning with the earlier this week and then into this weekend. But I was struck with the contrast of the beauty I experienced and saw and the ugliness of uh, violence and sin that we saw. Uh, it, was a, it was both ends of the spectrum for me. On one side, I saw the beauty of snowfall and the beauty of just the, the snow on trees and the crisp air. Um, and that's great. And then yesterday, we had we, the, with the group that packed the meals for Haiti. There was a great group of people and the beauty of people working together, laughing together, talking together, and sh making 3,252 meals for Haiti. Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. And then, last night on the news, I saw the ugliness, and we've heard about the ugliness of the, the violence in Memphis, and the person, the young man who was uh, killed in that violent uh, altercation. And then we see that ugliness, and we're moved by the ugliness of that and the violence of it, and it does something to us. And that's the world we live in. We live in a world of contrast between this beauty and simplicity and the violence and the ugliness of things. 
And I think what Jesus invites us into is to dwell as he dwells in the ordinariness of life, responding to those, those issues that beset us as human beings, as societies that move into conversations around justice and peace and all those things. In the midst of that, we continue to live our lives because when we live our lives and notice and are beautiful in ourselves, we remind the world that there's still hope, that there's still light, there's still beauty, there's still grace, there's still peace, even though our phones and our iPads and our computers and our televisions are filled with images that, that arrest us. Beauty reminds us of hope. So my contention today is, as we look at Jesus' teaching, and we look at Jesus himself, and we look at our, our lives, that God invites us into that ordinary world where beautiful things happen. And we, when we do that, we become signs of hope, as I said. We become agents of peace in just the ordinary, grace-filled lives that we live. Just as Jesus lived in that way. We cannot underestimate that every single one of us in our everyday lives make a difference and we don't even realize it. We don't have to be extravagant in that. But we can live our lives as Jesus lived his life in an ordinary, beautiful way. So the teaching today uh, that Jesus gives us, he contrasts that which is extraordinary and people who are trying to be extraordinary with an ordinary way of, of praying, of giving, of a religious practice of fasting. And so let's look at just briefly the contrast that Jesus gives us. So Jesus says about prayer, he says this, he said, uh, there are people who will pray and they think they'll be heard because of their many, many words that they say. They're trying to be extraordinary and extravagant with these incredibly beautiful words, thinking that the God or gods in the Greek speaking world of his day will somehow hear based on the effort being expended by the prayer, prayer. One person said, Greek prayers, pre Greek prayers and those who prayed in the, that day, that is, worshiped the deities of the Roman world, that was not the God of Israel, they piled up as many titles of the deity addressed as possible to flatter and persuade the deity, the God, to act somehow. If I'm just so beautiful or ornate in my words, then that God has to respond with such favor to me. And Jesus is pointing out the futile nature of this trying to be extraordinary, trying to be more than that's necessary, and saying we don't need to do that. Jesus says when people sometimes fast, that is, they refrain from something. And in his day, and for Jesus himself, he fasted for 40 days from food. People fast from all kinds of things. And he said, and he particularly was thinking about food because there's this disfigurement, there's this rigor that happens when this fasting happens. And it was a common practice in religious circles, still is today, by some Christians and other religions. Jesus says, look, he points out that there are people who fast and disfigure their faces, he says, in order to be seen, in order to be, uh, look pious. And look how great I am. Look how, how committed I am to this because I'm fasting and you should feel sorry for me, but also pat me on the back because of my commitment to this practice. And Jesus says, you don't need to do that. All right, Frank. Don't do that. Then he says, he talks about people storing up treasures on earth and, 
And he doesn't contrast to saying they're, they're trying to look better to their neighbors, but let's be honest. When we store up physical treasures on earth, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make ourselves look better. Trying to live better. And so Jesus says, don't store up treasures on earth where moths and thieves come and steal. Don't do that. Instead, store up treasures in heaven. Don't try to be all that. Instead, Jesus invites us into the ordinariness of life. The life that he himself is living and he lives. Matter of fact, so my question for us is, where have we been sometimes standing up and down, waving our arms, trying to get God to pay attention to us? If I just do enough good works, then maybe God's going to respond. Sometimes that is part of our psyche. God, has, I might not use flowery words in my prayers, but I'm going to really try hard and do good things for the church, for my neighbor, for everybody else, to make sure that God has to bless me because look how much of a blessing I am, God, right? That happens. To all of us at different seasons of our lives. We try to be impressive. If I try to be impressive to God, God's saying, I'm not impressed. I mean, you're not my son who died on the cross and rose from the dead. I mean, I, I can't. The pale, anything I do pales in comparison to that. Or we think, because I'm so... Or we go the other way. Because I'm so ordinary, because I... I'm not this, or I'm not that, I'm not, do, don't do this, or I don't do that. And we lower ourselves so much, we have so much lack of esteem for ourselves, we think, because we are so ordinary, God cannot even use me. Because look of what I don't have. We think about that. I don't have enough money, I don't have skills, my age is this or that. I'm not young anymore. I can't do this. I can't do that. There's no way God can use me. Burp. False. Matter of fact, in the New Testament, Paul says, we have this treasure that is the kingdom of God within us, the Holy Spirit. We have this treasure in clay jars. The metaphor being, we are clay jars fragile, ordinary, containing this beautiful treasure. Regardless of our age or ability or anything, we are this ordinary clay jar containing something incredibly beautiful. So we cannot disqualify ourselves because we think we're too ordinary. God says, you are ordinary and that is beautiful in itself. That's the beautiful thing. I have heard one priest one time say, we are use you and I are useless to God. Think about that for a second. We're useless to God. And that's a great thing. We don't need to be useful for God to love us. Think about a friend of yours. Is your friend your friend because they're useful to you? If they are, then you're, that is not a friendship. That is, part, that is like, a, a, like a partnership. But a true friend, a best friend, they're not your friend because they're useful. They're your friend because they're your friend. You like them. You love them for who they are. All their good parts and bad parts. Jesus calls us friends. We are his friend in our ordinariness, in our good parts and our bad parts. We don't have to be impressive or extravagant or use these fancy things or do these fancy words. Jesus says, you're my friend, you're useless to me, and that's okay. Because we're here this together. So then Jesus begins to teach us, what does it look like to live this ordinary life in this fasting, prayerful and store up treasures type of life that we live, that when we do these things, we are reminders of the hope that still persists in this world. Jesus says, well, 
He teaches an ordinary prayer on the contrast to those who use extravagant words to get the deities to stand up and down, wave their arms. Jesus says, no, you don't need to do that. Just simply use simple phrases with relational conversation. Our Father in heaven. Short phrases. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Save us from the, temp the time of trial. Deliver us from the evil one. They're just ordinary words, simple phrases. Our prayers do not need to be fancy for God to hear. Jesus even says, God even knows what's on your heart. The bottom line is what Jesus is emphasizing, he says that God is so loves us he want, he's not like he's waiting for us to ask. He wants to give us what we need. But the relationship is not based on extravagance. It's based, it's based on ordinary giving and ordinary speaking. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's beautiful, short. Matter of fact, Martin Luther says this about prayer. He said this. Prayer, Christian prayer, he says, is easy. For it proceeds in faith on the basis of the, prom basis of the promise of God, and it presents its need from the heart. It's simply from the heart, based on God's promises, we pray ordinary things, pray ordinary words, in ordinary language. Think about the word phrase, hallowed be your name. It's just an ordinary thing. It's your name's. Your name, God, is amazing. It's beautiful. Just itself, the name, Allah would be your name. Fast and secret. Do not be ordinary. Be inconspicuous, Jesus says. Don't disfigure your face. As a matter of fact, wash your face, put oil on your face. Look ordinary. Look normal. Because what, Father, what you're doing in secret and inconspicuous is blessing those around you. You don't even realize and store up your treasures in heaven. Don't worry about this life and all these trappings of this life. We need what we need, but at the end of the day, we're storing up treasures in heaven where moth and thieves cannot steal and destroy. There's beauty in being. There's beauty in ordinariness. There's beauty in just who we are, our fingers, our toes, our eyes, our faces. And God says, I see you as you are. And that's who I love. That's who I want to use. And so as we enter this week and as we continue to experience the contrast of the ugliness of the world, the violence and the injustice that we face and we hear about and we fight against and fight for justice and peace, we do so as Jesus did, inconspicuous, ordinary, to allow the extraordinary kingdom of God to come through us. To allow the extraordinary grace of God to flow through us. To allow the extraordinary presence of the Holy One in our hearts and minds to be spoken through our ordinary lips. And as we do so, we, as I said before, we remind the world around us that hope still persists. Love continues to flow. Peace is still possible, even though we feel despair and the destruction of lives around us. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you are kind and good. You lived this life as we've lived. You did so in such ordinary and grace-filled ways, and so help us, by your Holy Spirit, to use whatever we have to do whatever you desire in this world around us. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.
together we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. You may sit or kneel. God of life, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you love, forgive us, that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Please stand. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass and the new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new and we are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. Sharing our life, he lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to his own brilliant light. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise the, the, his name and join their unending hymn.
the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. United as one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come and taste the joy of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
Please stand. <coughs> the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Cultivate humility in your church. In gatherings of every size, teach us to boast only in the cross. Shape your church to be people of kindness, generosity, and justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. The foundations of the earth bear witness to your faithfulness. The mountains and hills echo with your holiness. When we mistreat your creation, show us the error of our ways. Inspire us with reverent awe to honor all you have made. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You make foolish the wisdom of the world. Raise up honorable leaders who seek justice, love mercy, and pursue peace. Fr frustrate plans that are corrupt, wicked, and self-seeking. Prosper the work of peacemakers. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Bless all whom the world rejects. Accompany those who are regarded as foolish, weak, lowly, and despised. Reveal your power and presence at work where it is least expected. Give your life, strength, and wisdom to all in need, especially Carrie Watley, the volunteers in our congregation, Jared and Diane, Brianne, Sandy Blousey, Jared Foley, Mary Ann Garrett, Jenna and Eric Haffenden, Paula Krissinger, Norma Lanker, Brian Patterson, Patty Peterson, Sarah Ward, Joyce Wilson, and the Wolcha family. We give thanks for the healing evident in, in Nancy Scherfe. Merciful God, receive our prayer. As with your people Israel, remind this congregation of your saving acts. Remind us how your faithfulness brought us through difficult, times and sustained us despite our weaknesses. Establish the cross as the center of our life together. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Praise to you for the blessed saints in every time and place. Trusting you accompanied them in poverty, persecution, and in every trial. We trust that you abide with, us, with your people always. We pray this week for comfort for the family and friends of Bill Long. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. You may be seated. And yeah, giving a moment. So for giving moment today, I just want to remind uh, you all of the teams that are on the walls, those papers. Uh, we invite you to add your name uh, to at least one of those teams, whether it be uh, a blue pen means I'm part of that team, a green means I want to be part of this team. And if you have questions about any of those teams um, and what they do, certainly I'll be out there. You can ask me and I can help you out with that. But remind, be reminded of what God gives us to do this type of work. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul writes, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given 
for the common good. And then Paul goes on to talk about specific uh, gifts that the Spirit gives us. And so it's not just about volunteering and sharing time. According to the Apostle Paul, it's a manifestation of God's activity among us. So being a reader or communion assistant or serving on a setup team or helping with this or that team in our church is the way God continues to operate in this world, in this church. That's why it's so important. It's evidence of God's work among us, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit. Now, what Paul doesn't say is uh, the spiritual gift of coffee making. But that's an important part. That's an important team. But we can, that is a manifestation of the Spirit because the beauty of a nice cup of coffee in the morning is good. But there are people who do that. There are people who on Sunday morning make the coffee. Um, and Patty Peterson reached out to those folks and said, what do you enjoy about serving in this role? And three, the responses were, it's something we can do to help with the fellowship at St. Luke. Most of my, another person said, my, most of my adult life, I've been one of the first to arrive at work at Lenten breakfasts, at church functions, so I've always been the one to make the coffee so others would have it when they arrived. It is one of those random acts of kindness. That's pretty cool, you know? It's a way to just be kind. Uh, third, uh, on Sunday mornings, I'm up early every day, so making coffee and ushering, I enjoy the people. So... That's one team, but there's many things uh, that we can be part of. So I encourage you to be part of that this morning if you've not done so already. So a few other announcements to highlight. And th the first one feeds right into our Volunteer Sunday. One of the reasons people don't like to volunteer is they're like, I don't know what to do. Well, we can solve that for one of, your, one of our uh, tasks. There will be usher training February 5th um, for both this, you know, services here in the sanctuary and for our services um, in the fellowship hall. And um, if you are an experienced usher, come and get a refresher course. If you are, can, would like to be an usher, but the thing holding you back is I don't know what they do. They look like they have a lot of jobs to do. Well, you can come and learn those, and it will be short and crisp and to the point, and there is a sign-up in your um, bulletin. So please let Jenny know. Jenny will be teaching you um, <laughs> that you can come and learn those things. Um, this is, I believe, the last weekend to do the Holy Cow assessment. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So if you have not already, please do. Um, we've gotten good responses, but everyone's input is valuable as we take those ideas and thoughts and moving forward into um, the call press process and, in, and forwarding the mission of St. Luke in the world. Um, coming up this Friday is um, hockey night. If you ha have not bought tickets, how many are left? Six tickets left. Six tickets left. Scarcity, folks. Come get <laughs> tickets before they are gone. Um, but it'll be a great night out. Um, parking is free. The tickets are only $10. Um, come join us. And the following Friday is Parents' Night Out. If you have young kids or if you know someone with kids, student ministry is providing um, babysitting for a few hours so that parents can go out. It's lovely. Um, and also we have Super Bowl Sunday coming up um, on February 12th when everyone else is, is planning. When you're planning that Super Bowl party, buy some extra food to go to Lutheran Social Services and um, think about bringing that in or put aside a check. Either way, um, I think that is it. Is there anything I missed? All right. Please stand. The God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod, bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen. Let's sing our hymn.
in peace, live in the way of Jesus. Thanks be to God.